my name is Lily. I am the worship director for the English and the Spanish service. I would like to say Happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. Um, and I hope that you are blessed this morning with uh, today's virtual service. God bless. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one ab another above yourselves. Romans 12, 9 through 10. Hi, I'm Sean Summers, and this is my wife, Sarah. I'm the assistant pastor, and we we have the opportunity to worship with you for this service. And we are going to sing a couple songs that talk about God's faithfulness and His promises and how He keeps His promises no matter what. And I hope that you will join us in worshiping God, that these songs speak to your heart and lead you into worship. Would you join us? Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battles won For you have never failed me yet Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Faithfulness I'm still in your hands This is my confidence You never failed me yet I know the night won't last Your word will come to pass My heart will sing your praise again Jesus you're still the now Keep me within your love My heart will sing your praise again You promise still sins Great is your faithfulness Faithfulness I'm still in your hands This is my confidence You never fail
as well Through it all, through it all My eyes are on you And it is If you're a Christian, if you have given your life to Christ, I hope you feel that, you know, it's well with your soul. It doesn't mean that the circumstances are always well. It doesn't mean that the world is always well. Uh, it doesn't mean that we feel always well. It means that there's something beyond our feelings, our hope, that, that holds fast because we know that God has taken care of us and is taking care of us. Man, I want to welcome you uh, to the service. I know people have already done that, but I just want to welcome you. I'm Michael. I'm the lead pastor here. I want to say happy Father's Day to our fathers. You have a special role in the life of your children, and I hope that you honor God with that role. I hope you strive to look like Him and live like He would in, uh, in His place in the lives of your families. Uh, and I want to give you a moment to just send out a virtual greeting to people. Number one, send a greeting to your dad. Just say, hey, dad, I'm in church and I'm thinking about you. I love you. I don't know if your dad goes to church or not, but just let him know, hey, I'm in church. I'm thinking about you. Happy Father's Day. I appreciate you. Send a text to someone in your faith community. Just tell them, hi, how are you? I'm in church. I miss you. I can't wait till we can all get back together, but I miss you. I'm thinking of you. And send a text to someone that's not part of your faith community. Don't be so inclusive. Send a text to someone and just say, man, you know what? I'm in church. I'm thinking about you. If there's anything I can be praying about, I would love to pray for you. To one of your friends that doesn't go to your church, not part of your faith community, maybe even doesn't believe what you believe. But it's amazing what happens when we start praying for people. And I think it shows people that we care about them too. At least I think so anyways. We are continuing our series called Faith Strong. And we're looking at stories in the Bible about faith. We, we want to be people who live great faith. We want to be people who, um, who inspire others, who fully believe in what God has said, and we live out a life that reflects that, right? And so we've been looking at these stories, and we've been uh, trying to find stories that, of people that have great faith, stories that inspire us, stories that, that uh, provide an example for us, stories where we can learn, well, what does it look like? If we want to have great faith, number one, what does it look like? And number two, how can I achieve it? And so we've been looking at these things for the last few weeks here, and today I want to look at another one. It's found in Joshua chapter 5. It's a story about Joshua who's leading Israel. And at this point, Israel is kind of God's chosen people, and I'll kind of explain a little bit what that means in a minute. And he has an encounter with an angel, and they have a really short conversation, but it's incredibly eye-opening and I think so important for where we are right now today in our world, and especially in 21st century Western culture, America, um, I think so important for us to understand as Christians. And so I wanna read you this passage of scripture. It's out of Joshua chapter five, but first, would you join me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time. I thank you, Father, for uh, an incredible church family that you've surrounded me with. I thank you for the incredible times that we're having, Father, even when it's so different for us. We can't get together. We can't meet. We can't shake hands. We can't hug. And yet, Father, you're somehow keeping us connected. I thank you for all the people that you've been connecting to yourself and to us, Father, or, or to yourself through us uh, in friends and family around the world, Lord. I thank you for what you've done for us and what it means that in, amidst all the chaos of the world, where we look out and we're like, man, I'm overwhelmed. I don't know what to do. I don't know which direction to take. I don't know what to say and what not to say. We thank you, Father, that amidst all the things that we see, we know that you've made a way for us to be with you in heaven and that you are at work setting things right and that one day you'll put everything right so that we don't have this kind of chaos, so that we don't have viruses, so that there's no more pain, no more tears, no more sorrow. We rest our hope in that, Father, and we want to live a faith according to that hope, according to who you are and what you've said and what you've promised us. Bless us during this time to hear from you, to hear your words in these scriptures and in the ways that we unpack them, Father, to speak into our contexts, into our circumstances and guide us. We ask these things for your glory and in Jesus' name, amen. 
So I want to read you this passage out of Joshua chapter 5. Uh, I'm going to start down in verse 13. It's a kind of a short passage. Um, Joshua is leading this group of people called the Israelites. And God has chosen them. And what that means is he says, you're going to be my people. You're going to be a, a nation of priests. A uh, priest is just someone who kind of connects people to God. He acts as an intermediary between people and God. He says, you're going to be a holy nation for me. And so what that means when he says that to them is he says, I'm going to live a life in relationship with you. And you're going to demonstrate to the world around you what it looks like to live in relationship with me. It doesn't mean that they're more special than anybody else. It doesn't mean that he doesn't love you as much as he loved them or something like that. Uh, it just means this is what God is doing. So Joshua is leading these Israelites and he's on his way to uh, this area of land that God has called to them, the promised land, the land that I've given you, that I've promised to give you. And They've been walking with God for quite a while, been through some serious challenges, and they're about to go into the promised land. Joshua has this encounter with an angel, and this is how the encounter goes. I'm going to start in verse 13. Now, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? And I'm going to pause here real quick because I think this is so important for us to understand. This is kind of the crux of what I want to talk about today. I think that's how we see the world. There's an us and there's a them. There's an us and there's an, our enemies. There's us and there are the people who are against us. And, and because there are people who are against us, there are people we're against. So he goes up to this angel and he says, are you for us? Or are you for our enemies? I, I see that today in... In our world, man, politics, are you Republican? Are you Democrat? Are you, are you this religion? Are you that religion? Are you, do you make these lifestyle choices? Do you make these lifestyle choices? We're such an us against them culture, an us and them culture, which makes us an us against them culture. And I think this is so telling. I know this happened thousands of years ago. Amazing. Here's where we still are. Are you for us? or you're for our enemies. Neither, he replied. What? Wait a minute. You gotta, be, you gotta be either on our side or on their side. Which one is it? Neither, he replied. See, here's the thing as we read this scripture that we want to understand. We see it like this. Are you for us? Or are you for our enemies? The angel says, neither. I'm for God. I'm for what's right. And as much as you are for what's right, I'm for you. And as much as you're against what's right, I'm against you. See, there's only one right side. And it's not this side and it's not that side. It's not them and it's not us. It's God's side. And here's something that Christians in 21st century America need to learn. There's only one right side. God might be with you, but that doesn't necessarily mean he's for you. If you are for what's right, then you're with him. Neither, he replied, but as commander of the Lord, uh, of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did so. I want to just quick side note to where we're going here. He says, take off your sandals. The place where you are standing is holy. Wherever you meet with God, it's a holy place. And we talked about this a little bit last week. So if you're watching this and you're in your kitchen, if you're in your living room, if you're in your bedroom, if you're in your car listening, wherever you meet with God is a holy place. He says, take off your sandals. This is a holy place. Where God meets with you is a holy place. And uh, there's a man named Abraham, and, and all throughout Scripture, he meets with God a couple different times throughout his life. And every time he meets with God, he stops and he builds a little altar there. He sets that, si that space apart as special, as holy, as a reminder, I met with God. He said these things. Because sometimes God says things and it takes a while to work out, right? He wants to remember those things. And I always say, man, where you meet with God, make it special. Make it holy. Where you meet with God in your time, in your place, in your way, remember it, memorialize it, write it down. 
he has this meeting with God and he says, I want you to remember this, man. Are you, am I for you or am I for your enemies? Neither. And I want you to remember what that means. I think that's so perfect for us right now as we go through, you know, here's how I feel about the pandemic. Here's how I feel about wearing masks. Here's how I feel about, you know, uh, everybody buying up toilet paper. Here's how I feel about Black Lives Matter. Here's how I feel about police officers. Here's how I feel about social justice. Here's how I feel about defunding the police. We have no shortage of sides to pick. And I think that that's what we do. We kind of try and co-opt God onto our side. Like, are you for us? Or are you for our enemies? And I think God would say the same thing to us in most cases. I think he would say, neither. I'm for what's right. And if you're for what's right, then not only am I with you, but I'm for you. But if you're for what's wrong, even if you have good intentions, I'm not for you. There's only one right side, and it's God's side. And I think sometimes that's kind of a hard line for us to walk. Nobody gets up in the morning and says, man, I want to be against God. What can I do today to be against God? Nobody gets up in the morning and says that. In fact, we kind of create structures around us that we think, well, I think this is what God is for, um, so I think that I'm with God in this. And, And we start creating these things, sometimes political parties, Sometimes uh, social change parties. Uh, Sometimes those things are two in the same, or one in the same. Uh, We create all kinds of ways, I think, to kind of guide us in, in doing the right things. But if we want God to be for us, we need to make sure we're on His side. And I want to talk today about what that looks like. What does that mean? How can we get up in the morning and say, man... I want, if I ran into an angel today, if I ran into God today, I would want to say, are you for me? And he would say, yes, yes, I am, because you're with me on the side of right. What does that look like? Well, the first thing I think is this, man. Check your sources. Check your map. If if we want to be on the side of right, we need to check the things that are guiding us, the things that are informing us. And, you know, In reality, that's the whole reason the Bible is given to us by God. God says, I'm going to give you this book full of my words that tells you who I am, how I am, and how you should live in light of me. In one passage of Scripture, it tells us that everything that's written is useful for teaching and rebuking and encouraging, basically telling us how to live. And it's so funny. The Bible is meant to inform us. But we kind of have all these different ways that we have come along now in in our culture and our time to inform our lives, to inform how we should think and what we should do and how we should act and how we should think about people that don't think like we think. I'll give you three thoughts real quick and under this idea. Check your sources. Check your map. check, Check what's guiding you. I'll give you three sources that we use today. Number one, politics. Politics guides our opinions, informs us of what we think or what we should think, and we pick our political party accordingly. The news guides our opinions now, probably now more than ever before. When I was younger and growing up, the news was, I don't know that it was ever not biased, but it just didn't seem like it. It wasn't as readily apparent, I guess. It just reported, here's what was happening. Nowadays, I don't care what station you watch, it's not the news. It's just an op-ed piece that's filtering the news. I don't care what channel you watch, but we watch the news and that informs us who we are, how we're supposed to live, what we should think, what's going on in the world and how we should react to it. And especially if you're younger, social media. Social media has just come on the scene and blown up. It's like an avalanche that you can't stand against. Something starts moving on social media and it, it just, it takes precedence over everything and it tells us here's what you should be seeing here's what you should be thinking about what you see and here's what everybody else should think too and those things inform us and guide us and sometimes they're helpful but they're not meant to be our primary source our primary navigation our for life our primary map they're all supposed to be secondary to the bible and and i know what you're saying you're sitting there and you're going yeah yeah i know that i know that yeah absolutely 
Except for here's the problem. Most Christians aren't reading the Bible. Most Christians are counting on things like this to inform them of what the Bible says. And I always say, man, don't just count on me to tell you what the Bible says. I think I'm right. I hope I'm right. But you should be reading the Bible. You should know it. See, here's the thing. We kind of try and take the Bible into all these different sources that we have, but those sources somehow sometimes become primary in our lives. Our politics, man, people identify themselves now by their political party. I'm conservative, I'm liberal, I'm Republican, I'm Democrat, I'm Libertarian, I'm a Tea Party, you know, whatever it might be. That's the way we identify ourselves. It's, it's crazy. Here's the thing, and, and, and let me tell you something. Each, each party tries to kind of co-opt the Bible in certain verses to, to be like, this is God's party. This is how God thinks. This is what God would do. Um, and, and it's a, a right direction, but a wrong execution. See, the Bible is not meant to cater to your politics. It's meant to inform your politics. Man, I am of the mind that people should stop saying, I'm Republican, I'm Democrat, I'm conservative, I'm liberal. And they should just start saying, I'm Christian, because that should say it all. Stop letting your politics inform your opinions and let the Bible inform your opinions. It's so funny, we have whole organizations now that are, that are dedicated to telling you, here's what's happening, here's how you should think about it, and let me fill you with a bunch of rhetoric so when you run into someone that thinks differently than you, you can shout out these things that you don't know anything about, but they sound really good, and you can argue with people. Man, if you want to know who you should be and how you should live and what you should think about stuff, read the Bible. Put your Christianity before your politics. We watch the news, right? And that tells us. That tells us. Oh, we watch the news and it tells us, here's what you should think. Here's how you should see this thing. And everybody has their experts that tell us, this is why this side is right. Man, uh, it's the same thing. They're telling you who you should be and how you should think. And the more that we watch those things, the more we can become those people. I tell people, man, stop watching the news. And, and before the news really blew up, I would tell people, stop watching talk radio, man. People would listen to their own talk radio. Someone's listening to conservative talk radio. Someone's listening to liberal talk radio. And, and they would, you know, they got their arguments and everything like that. And I, I said to people, stop listening to talk radio. It just, number one, it just makes you angry. And number two, it just tells you the same things that you already think over and over again. You never get to hear any good thoughts from the other side so that you can make an informed decision. You just hear the same things over and over. You become indoctrinated in it. You become almost hypnotized by it. People tell me, man, I can't stop watching the news. I need to watch the news to know what's going on in the world. And I say, man, stop watching the news to know what's going on in the world and start reading the Bible to know how you should be going on in the world. You've got to stop letting people who are not Christians, who are not speaking from the Bible, tell you how you're supposed to live and what you're supposed to think. And, and especially if you're younger, social media, it's crazy, right? It's crazy. I, it, the thing that blows me away about social media is this. It's really boiled down to like, it's a picture and a caption, and then people post it, and then someone sees it, and they're like, man, that makes me mad, and they repost it, they retweet it, they re-whatever. And I'll ask people sometimes, what do you know about that? Have you looked into the background of that? What have you heard about it? I don't know anything about it, but, you know, I, it makes me mad, and I think it's important people should know, so I just retweet it. Okay. And social media informs how we think now, how we think we should think. Social media says, you know, it becomes this kind of avalanche slide, this kind of like digital peer pressure that everybody has to think a certain way and feel a certain way. And you can't say, well, wait a minute. I do think that, but no buts. If you don't think this, unfriend me. If you don't think this, you're part of the problem. If you don't think this, whoa, what happened to critical thinking? What happened to getting together and conversing? And here's what's funny about social media, especially for Christians. I mean, maybe not for other people, but for Christians. It's so funny to me. Man, 
I'll post a verse almost every single day. A verse, a beautiful picture, and a devotion, and all these kind of things. Words of life, words that come right out of the Bible, and, and words that tell you, man, here's, here's, here's what the Bible says how we should live. And you know what? Maybe like two, three, five, six, seven likes. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe two shares. One of them is my wife who loves me, right? I say, man, how come you guys don't like Bible verses? How come you guys don't repost Bible verses the way you repost everything else? Oh, man, I don't want to. Religion is, I don't want to offend anybody. Meanwhile, if you don't believe this, unfriend me. If you don't believe this, you're part of the problem. If you don't believe this, you're, you know, pick your negative adjective. You don't want to, you don't want to offend anybody with the words of life? That's crazy to me. So social media kind of guides how we how we live, how we think. And the more that we're on social media, and for younger people, it's more and more. You just scroll. Like your only lens into the outside world is social media. If we want to be on the side of right, social media helps. The news helps in its own way. Politics and the way that we vote and the way that we uh, elect people to change our laws and change our structures, those, those all have their place. But they shouldn't be primary. And they've become primary. And I think that's why God would say this. I'm not on your side. Well, I, th- I thought you were on my side. I'm a Christian. Ah. First, check your sources. Second, check yourself. Check yourself. Man, if the Bible's supposed to inform who we are, inform, not just inform like tell us, inform, be in us and form in us, who we are, we should live like it. We should act like it. We should be people who reflect what the Bible says. There's a passage in the Bible that says this. It says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Do you understand what that's saying? It's saying, go through the hard work of looking at all your actions, all your thoughts, all the things you say, and see if they align with what the Bible says. See if they align with the faith that you're proclaiming. Man, that's tough. It it requires us to examine ourselves. We can't just say, well, my mom and dad were Christian, so I'm a Christian. Well, I go to church, so I'm a Christian. Well, I said that prayer one time, so I'm a Christian. The Bible is saying, no, look and see if you're acting like a Christian. And I got to be honest with you. I see so many Christians doing very unchristian-like things. I see so many Christians saying very unchristian-like things. Examine yourself, check yourself, check yourself to see whether you're in the faith. Number one, I would say, especially in our time right now, man, let's look for our prejudices. Not just against the social constructs that are happening right now, but everything. Man, I got to tell you, I'm so tired of Christians saying, well, even in a pandemic, I won't wear a mask. I won't. I'm not, you can't make me. What is that? Does that line up with any verse in the Bible? Can you point to a verse that says, yeah, man, grab your rights and you assert them and let no one take them from you. Because I'll throw down several different verses that say, man, the meek will inherit the earth. Blessed are the peacemakers. As much as it is possible for you, be at peace with your brothers and sisters. Be at peace with everyone. Consider others as better than yourself. Consider their interests before your own. And I'll go on and on. Man, check yourself. Does the way you think align with what the Bible says? Check your labels. And not necessarily what you are labeling other people, although that's obviously really important. I think that's pretty obvious, right? I don't know any Christians that are, um, personally, I don't know any Christians that are throwing around labels that I think, man, that's not Christian at all. But here's what I would tell you. It's really interesting. Check the label you put on yourself. The labels you put on other people are obviously important, but just as important as the label you put on yourself. What you choose to cover yourself with, the label that you put yourself, the box that you put yourself in, begins to form you, inform you, change you, and more and more you conform to the patterns of that particular label. So people say, I'm a conservative, and all of a sudden, they're way more conservative than they are actually Christian. People say, I'm liberal. Oh, they're way more liberal than they actually are Christian. And it just becomes about carrying out those labels and living out those labels and defending 
those labels. Check yourself and see what label you put on yourself. I'll give you an example. I had a friend and he began riding motorcycles. So he began riding motorcycles. Like, who cares? What does that matter? Uh, and then after a while, because he was riding motorcycles, he began to hang out with other people that were riding motorcycles. Well, because he was hanging out with other people that were riding motorcycles, that was becoming his community. And then those people dressed a certain way, so he kind of started dressing that way. It looked like a motorcycle rider. And because he was dressing that way, and that was his community and the people that he were in, after a while, he started talking that way, too. He adopted vocabulary that was specific to motorcycle riders that other people didn't use. He referred to cars as cages. It's some kind of like, almost like a disparaging remark, you know. And he became every bit a motorcycle rider because that's one of the labels he put on himself. And little by little, those labels transformed him into, you know, now full-fledged. Like, got the, got the hair, got the motorcycle, got the, got the community, got the language, got the dress. The labels we put on ourselves are just as important. And we need to be able to say, look in the mirror and say, I'm a Christian. That informs how I think, that informs how I speak, that informs how I look at other people, how I treat other people, that informs what I think of as justice, it informs how I enact that justice. We need to be Christian first, that needs to be your first label. And quite honestly, I would say, man, that's really all the labels you need. But that's just me. And then finally, check your shadow. Check your shadow, man. It's one thing for us to say, uh, I'm a Christian, and I've looked inside, and I think my life and my thoughts and my actions match what Christianity says on the inside or in my thinking. But then check your shadow. Make sure that what follows you around looks like what you're saying. Man, I meet so many Christians that, you know, uh, I would say, I, I think like, man, are you sure that's a Christian action? Are you sure that's how Christ would do it? And we have all kinds of excuses. Well, you know, those people this or these people that or, you know, blah, blah, blah. Make sure your actions, you got to be, you got to check yourself and look on the inside and then you got to check the outside too. You got to look at how you talk to people. You got to look at how uh, you think of people. You got to look at what motivates you. We want to look at our shadow and we want it to look like us. In fact, we want to look at our shadow and hopefully it looks like Jesus. Man, this is, this is a great time for Christians to be Christians. For Christians to do the things that Jesus did. To love people, first and foremost, to love people unconditionally, across the board. This is a great time for Christians to actually do that. And, 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 and the highest part of that, love your enemies. I don't know about you. I don't have any enemies. I don't have anybody that I consider an enemy. I have people that I disagree with. I have people that disagree with me and people that sometimes say disparaging things about me or about my beliefs or my faith or whatever, but I don't have any enemies. But Jesus said, even love your enemies. Pray for them and don't curse them. Bless them and don't curse them, he says. This is a great time for Christians to be Christians. And as we look out at the scene that's in front of us and say, how do I engage in this? We engage like a Christian. We engage like a Christian. I think sometimes in the midst of our marches, in the midst of our political debates, in the midst of, you know, we might say, we might run into an angel and we might say, are you for us? Or are you for our enemies? And I think that angel would say, neither. I'm for right, I'm for God, and you should be too. Man, that's what the world needs. It needs Christians to be Christians. It doesn't need them to be conservatives. It doesn't need them to be liberals. It doesn't need them to be Republicans. It doesn't need them to be Democrats. It doesn't need them to be Black Lives Matters. It doesn't need them to be uh, police officers. Uh, it needs them to be Christians in all of those roles. It needs the power of the Holy Spirit changing us on the inside to become like God in the way that we think, in the way that we act, in the way that we speak, in the way that we love. And, you know, 
like I said, there's, there's the, here's these things that you can do and, and check yourself to make sure that you're right with God. But you also, you, you need to be submitted to God. You need to be in a relationship with Him and submitted to Him so that He can fix the things on the inside of us that we just can't fix. There are some things that make me angry, and no matter what I think about whether it's right or wrong to be angry about that thing, they just make me angry. I need God to come in and change that in me. And that only happens through a relationship with Him. If you feel that, if you're like, man, I want to be part of what fixes the world, but I need to be fixed myself first, get in a relationship with God. It's very simple. Pray this prayer with me. Dear Heavenly Father, today I give you my life. I surrender myself to you. I acknowledge you as my God. Jesus, I thank you for your sacrifice on the cross, and I give you my sins, my brokenness to be forgiven. Now come and heal me. Show me who you are and teach me how to live a life of love and heal the things in me that keep me from living out a life of love. Today I give you myself. Today I become your follower. I make you God of my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you pray that we call that being born again. It means that you've begun a, new, begun a new relationship with God. I encourage you to get into a, a faith-based community where you can learn who God is and how He's said to live. And you can be around people that encourage God's working in you and help you in those things. We have one more song that, um, that we're going to be singing just for you to think about what's been said by these scriptures, what they mean. What does it mean when He says, are you for us or for our enemies? Neither. What does that mean for you in your context? What would that look like if you were in that story? What do these things mean to you? No, this is time for you to reflect on those things. Take some time. Let these words minister to you. Think about what's been said. Let God speak to you. And then go out, be a Christian. Change the world because of your Christianity. God bless you. Thank you for joining us.
sell my heart through all of my failure and pride. On the hill you created, the light of the world abandoned in darkness to die. And as you speak. I hope that song moved you into a place of deep worship, the kind that hits you in the heart and makes you feel it. I'm Anna, I'm the children's pastor, and I wholeheartedly believe that we can worship in more ways than just with our mouth or with our body. And I know that it's the end of the service and you might be ready to check out, but don't, there's still opportunity for you to worship God here, for him to speak to you here. So I wanna invite you to worship with us by joining us at our live Facebook gathering right after this. Be part of the body of believers. Uh, come hang out. It's what we would normally do right after church anyway. So we wanna invite you to that on our Crossroads Facebook page at 1130. Now, along with that, being part of the body and the community, we wanna invite you to worship God by emailing us your prayer requests or your thoughts, your concerns and your questions and really just anything. You can email us at office at crossroadsjourney.com. And then I wanna invite you to worship God with your finances. And I know that sounds wild, but there's something really powerful about giving over control of your finances and telling God, I trust you, do what you will with it. So I wanna invite you into that. You can do that by going to our website and looking for our giving tab. You can text any amount to the number that you see or you can mail a check to the church. And we do our very best to use those resources to advance the kingdom. Now, I wanna invite you in another way of worship, which is inviting somebody else to worship with you, whether it's joining our live Facebook gathering or whether it's sharing this message with them so that they can also watch it and hear the gospel message. Worship God in that way as well. I just wanna say quickly, happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for the role that you play in our lives and whether you're our dad or not, thank you for the fatherly roles that you play and the ways that you help disciple us. We appreciate you guys. I'm gonna pray really quick and close this out. God, thank you so much for dads. Thank you for who they are and how you're growing them. Thank you for the ways that they disciple us and move us, God. And Thank you for the community that you're building here. Thank you for giving us so many ways to worship you, God. And I pray, Lord, that, that we do, that we take every opportunity to worship you, God. Bless the people for having been here today, for being part of this community, God. I pray all these things for your glory and your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thanks again for joining us, and we can't wait to see you at our live Facebook gathering.